All right, what you're going to want to do is have the Unit 2 test review, um, the updated corrected one. For some reason, cell communication got cut off again on that last time, but it is Sunday, and A and B block don't have the test till Wednesday, so you still have time. Um, so I'm going to go through the questions. Some of the questions I might just say look in your notes for because it would just be, um, it would take a lot of time for me to just read something to you that was on your notes. So I'm going to focus on the ones that I actually need to help you with. So I am on the test review number one and it's talking about or it's asking about surface area volume and how that relates to the efficiency of a cell. Do, 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 do. Let me go down. I'm not asking you about electron microscopes or anything. You do need to procureouts and eukaryotes. Where is the size of the cell? Here it is. Yes, I'm not editing this video, so you get what you get. Okay, uh, we talked about, oh, the smaller the cell, the larger the surface area to volume ratio, the better the rate of diffusion. And I think it, this is the slide I was looking for. Sorry about that. Um, so a lot of students missed this question on the quiz, and I was really confused because it gave you four different types of cells and four different surface area to volume ratios. The cell that has the largest surface area to volume ratio. That means taking surface area and dividing it by volume. The one that has the largest number that results from that division, surface area to volume, is the one that's the most efficient. The one that has the largest surface area to volume ratio is also going to be the smallest cell. So I think that's something that feels like counterintuitive. The smaller the cell, the larger the surface area to volume ratio. I don't know, I don't know what other way to say it. Um, so there's, there's going to be a question on that. Uh, differences between prokaryotes and eukaryotes. You had a slide. It looks just like this. It's important to know that prokaryotes have no nucleus. They have no membrane-bound organelles. They do have ribosomes, though. Eukaryotes also have ribosomes, so they have that in common. They both have a cell membrane, so they have that in common. Prokaryotes have a cell wall. Some eukaryotes have a cell wall, not all of them. All right. Um, all the differences between prokaryotes and eukaryotes, what are the things that they have in common? Okay, that's pretty much everything that's on this slide. So I would go to that place in your notes and, and just read over that and review over that. Um, it says prokaryotes on number four do not have membrane-bound organelles. What are the membrane-bound organelles that prokaryotes do not have? Well, we can list them. Mitochondria, chloroplasts. ER, Golgi, lysosomes. There's no peroxisomes. No nucleus. There's no nuclear membrane. I think I'm missing them all. All they have is genetic material and ribosomes and the cell membrane and a cell wall. That's all they have. All right, nucleus. Ready to do this? Okay, sorry, the clicking is kind of annoying, so I'll do a different click. Uh, what are the parts of the nucleus? What is chromatin and what are what is the nucleolus? So the nucleus is like this sphere. It has a double membrane, which is a nuclear envelope. It's continuous with the ER. There's pores in it. that controls what enters and leaves. The nucleolus is the very center of the nucleus that makes ribosomes. Ribosomes don't stay in the nucleus, though. They leave, and they go to either the cytosol or the ER, rough ER. Uh, chromatin. This is showing you a picture of chromatin right here. Chromatin is DNA wrapped around proteins called histones. So that's chromatin, and that's found in the middle of the nucleus. So DNA is wrapped around uh, proteins. It helps uh, condense it, organize it, keep it all together. All right, ribosomes, the job of the ribosomes. I'm on number six. The job is to make proteins. Free ribosomes are going to make proteins for the cell that they are in. Bound ribosomes are um, going to make proteins for export. Um, export meaning they're going to need to be packaged in a vesicle and fused with the cell membrane. So a bound ribosome could make proteins for the cell that it's in if that protein is going to be deposited in the cell membrane. So think about it. If a protein's being made in the rough ER, 
it gets packaged into a vesicle, the vesicle goes to the Golgi, it gets packaged and processed and the vesicle goes to the membrane, fuses with the membrane, but instead of like pushing the protein all the way out of the cell, it just deposits the protein into that cell's membrane. So if proteins are being made for that cell, but they're made for that cell's membrane, they're gonna go through bound ribosomes. Just in case. Ooh, people that are listening to this video are gonna have such a good hint on um, the FRQ. It just, it pays to come to test reviews. It pays to listen to things like this and to look at uh, the test reviews that I host. I'm just, can't believe how many people haven't opened it, but I'm not gonna be bitter about that. It's fine, it's fine. I'm sure everyone's gonna do great. All right, um, five components of the endomembrane system. So everyone's like, what's the fifth one? I would say the first one is the nuclear envelope because the nuclear envelope is going to attach to the ER. So I would say that's one of the five parts. So nuclear envelope, ER, Golgi, lysosomes, and vacuoles, and vesicles, vacuoles slash vesicles. But a vacuole is a large vesicle. All right, so that was nuclear membrane, ER, Golgi, lysosomes, vacuoles, vesicles. All right, jobs of the rough ER, we already did that. Jobs of the rough ER, jobs of the smooth ER, just kidding, we haven't done that. Uh, rough ER is for packaging and transporting um, proteins, making replacement membrane, that was an important one. Smooth ER, uh, synthesizing lipids, that was the one that I pointed out in class. All right, Golgi, synthesis and packaging of materials. It receives vesicles and it ships vesicles. Uh, number 10, lysosomes, intracellular digestion, recycling cells, materials, programmed cell death, apoptosis. So apoptosis is uh, when hydrolytic enzymes are released and it basically like digests and chops up everything in the cell. So that's what lysosomes are for. Where are they made in the Golgi? What do they do? Intracellular digestion or apoptosis? What do they use to do their job? Hydrolytic enzymes, right? Vacuoles, what are they? Large vesicles, they are large vesicles. What are a few examples in plants and animals? Um, I would just say an example in the plant would be the large central vacuole. An example in animals could be uh, food, water, minerals, and some plants have uh, vacuoles for pigments and poisons. All right, what is the path of a protein from DNA to protein secretion? All right, so remember, you're just gonna have to follow my cursor because I don't have my, um, my marking pen thing. So DNA gets transcribed into RNA in the nucleus. RNA leaves the nucleus and goes to a bound ribosome. The bound ribosome is where translation happens and a protein gets made. The protein then gets packaged into a vesicle, moves to the Golgi, fuses with the Golgi. It gets processed, then packaged in a vesicle again, moves to the plasma membrane, fuses with the plasma membrane. And then either it stays in the membrane or it leaves the cell completely. All right, number 13. Differences and similarities between plant and animal cells. Well, plants or animal cells don't have chloroplasts or a central vacuole or a cell wall. That's the most important thing. They don't have chloroplasts, a central vacuole, or a cell wall. I don't, I'm not really going to go over any more of that other stuff because I think it, that's pretty basic. Mitochondria is the site of cellular respiration. What if the cristae, what are the cristae and why are there so many folds? Uh, if you look here, the cristae are the folds of the inner membrane. Why are there so many folds? Well, that's where ATP synthesis, that's where the electron transport chain is. And so if there's a lot of folds, that increases surface area to volume ratio and it makes it more efficient at making ATP. Great, chloroplasts, what is their job? Cytophotosynthesis. You're gonna have to, if you're, if you're writing while I'm talking, you're gonna have to pause if you haven't figured that out yet. Because this video is, oh, this is going to be a lot. This is going to be a little bit long. Um, endosymbiont theory. There is a question about the endosymbiont theory on your test. It is believed that a eukaryote-like ancestor engulfed 
a prokaryote thing that became a mitochondria, and then another prokaryote thing that eventually became the chloroplast. So basically a eukaryote ancestor ate a mitochondria and a chloroplast and then decided it wanted to live in, sim in symbiosis together forever. Um, the question you'll be asked is about the evidence. So you'll need to be able to spout out like, what are the three evidences? Well, they are double membraned, chloroplast and mitochondria double membrane. Chloroplast and mitochondria have their own ribosomes and their own DNA, and they can reproduce independently within the cell. They can just divide and divide um, independently within the cell. So that's the evidence. Okay, peroxisomes. Break down fatty acids and detox the body from alcohol. It makes hydrogen peroxide in the process. An enzyme called catalase further breaks hydrogen peroxide down into catalase. Breaks hydrogen peroxide down into water and oxygen. And you knew that from that lab that you did. Okay, I'm on to number 18. Cytoskeleton for support, motility. Now you all remember all of these things. So you have three parts, microtubules, microfilaments, intermediate filaments. Uh, microtubules are for the spindle of mitosis and meiosis, and they're the components of the cilia and flagella. Microfilaments are for cell movement. What that means is like total cell movement. A lot of students saw cilia or flagella on the quiz and thought, oh, microfilaments. So microtubules make up cilia and flagella, but there's microfilaments on the inside of the cell that helps the cell kind of move around. It's a different, it's a different type of movement. Um, and then intermediate filaments like fixed organelles in place. I, I would say if you're ever like given a question or you're ever needing to say a part of the cytoskeleton, man, always, always focus on microtubules because those are always the ones that are asked about most often. Okay. Number 19, centrioles. There's two centrioles in an animal cell. It's the microtubule organizing center. This is, they move to opposite ends of the cell right before mitosis and they make the spindle. They form the spindle for mitosis. Uh, the purpose of the ECM, that wasn't in this chapter, that was on the next chapter, but we said it was for uh, protection, extracellular matrix, and that's in chapter five. It's for protection and adhering of cells to other cells. So yeah, we talked about cilium flagella. See, it's right there. So it strengthens it, it transmits signals. I would just say it's for protection and adhering to other cells. It can help transmit signals too, I guess. Um, animal junctions, tight junction, two cells are fused to form a watertight seal in the example of skin cells. Desmosomes, it's a type of junction that uh, forms rivets so that the cells can fasten together to form sheets. Find that in muscles. Gap junctions are channels, they have like a hole. So if you're, when you're looking at this, like look at the picture. The picture shows you like a really good visual. Tight junctions, desmosomes, gap junctions. So you can see the difference in the picture. So always, always look at the pictures if you're confused on something. Pictures help. And then the type of junction in uh, plants is called plasma desmata. It's like a gap junction because it's actually like a hole between. So if you can see where my cursor is right here, these are the plasma desmata. It's like a little, it's like a little hallway, like a little walkway through the cell wall, so that ions and other molecules can get from one cell to another, and they're helping each other out. All right. That's it for chapter four. Let's do chapter five now. And then I'm on chapter five. So this would be your notes, pages 55 to 62. I'm on number one. What does it mean for the membrane to be selectively permeable? Some substances can cross and some can't. All right, number two, what are the properties of the phospholipids? Oh, so pretty. Phospholipids, they have a hydrophilic head and hydrophobic tails, which makes them antipathic. It forms a hydrophobic barrier. It keeps hydrophilic molecules out unless they're really small, like water and nitrous oxide. But for the most part, it's going to keep hydrophilic substances out. Um, how does the membrane adapt to cold temperatures? It will form unsaturated hydrocarbon tails, which forms a bend 
or a kink, so that keeps it from packing too close together when it's cold, so the cell membrane doesn't become a solid. Cholesterol can also prevent packing when it's cold. And then it wants to know if it's hot, how does it adapt? Only cholesterol. I mean, you could say, well, it forms more saturated hydrocarbons. Well, yeah, you could say that. It would go in the other direction and you'd have only saturated hydrocarbon tails. That's fine. Okay. What are the properties of integral transmembrane proteins? Well, if an integral protein or transmembrane protein, we're just going to consider those to be the same things. If they're embedded through the membrane, they have to be amphipathic with a hydrophobic interior and hydrophobic or hydrophilic ends. Hydrophobic interior and hydrophilic ends. That makes it amphipathic. That's the only way it's going to be able to sit in the membrane like that. All right. Number five. What are the functions of membrane proteins? That's in your notes. You're just listing them out. Transport, enzyme, signaling, cell-to-cell -cell recognition, intracellular joining, joining, and attachment to the cytoskeleton and the ECM. That's easy. You're just getting that straight from your notes. Uh, what is the function of a membrane carbohydrate? Cell-to-cell -cell recognition and the development of an organism. What can and cannot freely pass through the membrane? Okay, here we go. What can pass through the membrane? Freely. Small molecules. And hydrocarbons. And hydrophobic molecules. So small molecules polar or nonpolar, like water, hydrocarbons, like steroid hormones, hint, hint, steroid hormones like testosterone can freely pass through the cell membrane. So when they're looking for their receptor, it's going to be inside the cell already. So whoever's listening to this, you'll get that question right, because it's on there. Um, hydrophobic and then CO2 and O2 can pass through freely. What cannot pass through? ions in large polar molecules. An example of a large polar molecule would be sugar and amino acids and nucleic acids. Those are all large polar molecules that cannot freely pass through the cell membrane. All right, what do each of these words mean and what do they have in common? Each of these words is the uh, movement of a substance from a high to a low concentration without the use of energy. What they all have in common yeah, they don't need energy. So passive transport is the overarching word here. Passive transport just means no energy is needed. The two types of passive transport is simple diffusion and facilitated diffusion. Those are the two types. Simple diffusion freely passes the membrane and facilitated diffusion needs a protein to help it pass the membrane. An example of simple diffusion is osmosis. Osmosis is the diff simple diffusion of water. And remember, um, water doesn't move from a high to a low water concentration. It moves from a high to a low water potential. From a low to a high solute concentration. From a high to a low solute potential. And from a high to a low pressure potential. Rewind that if you need it. All right, so that's osmosis. Um, it says something about facilitated diffusion. Facilitated diffusion is just the, it doesn't require any energy and it's the movement of a substance from a high to a low concentration across the cell membrane with the help of a protein, of a membrane protein. Like an ion channel would be an example of that. An aquaporin would be an example of that. All right, how do you know when a cell, I'm on number nine. How do you know when a cell is hypertonic, isotonic, or hypotonic, give an example of each. Well, if it's hypertonic, then there's more solute on the outside than there is on the inside, so it shrivels, water leaves. If it's isotonic, there's equal concentrations of solutes, there's no net movement. Hypotonic, there's more solute on the inside of the cell, so water moves in. Give an example of each. Um, I mean, Okay, hypotonic would be like putting a saltwater fish into a freshwater tank. Hypertonic would be like putting a freshwater fish into a saltwater tank. <laughs> it's so morbid. I'm so sorry. 
And then isotonic, an example of isotonic would be when you get an IV bag and the IV bag says 0.9% NaCl. I guess another example of hypotonic situation would be if you had got an IV and it only had distilled water in it. That would suck. All right. Number 10, fill in the blanks. Oh, I already said this. I'm going to say it again. I already said it. <laughs> yep, we got all that. We got all that. All right. Water will move from A, high to low water potential. Water will move from A, low to high solute concentration. Water will move from A, high to low solute potential. Water will move from a high to a low pressure. Great, cool. Um, and then I want to go through, oh, this was facilitated diffusion. So remember it goes under the topic of diffusion. A substance is just moving from a high to a low concentration, but it needs the help of a channel protein because look, look at these examples, ions, polar molecules, like amino acids, large amounts of water, glucose. They can't pass the membrane, they can't do it. They would just be stuck on the outside. So they have these proteins that have little channels through them or that have are carriers that help them get through. And this is an example of a facilitated diffusion for water. Okay. And then the glucose transport protein is a carrier protein that's still facilitated diffusion. It just, if y'all remember me like picking something up and then dropping it down, it's just, um, it, it's normally closed until the substance comes to it because that just means that the substance is too large to have a channel for it. Okay, two types of active transport discussed in the notes, electrogenic pumps and bulk transport Describe each one of these. Yay. So active transport requires energy. Just need to be able to say this. The sodium potassium pump. It pumps three sodiums out for every two potassiums in. It creates a positive charge on the outside and a negative charge on the inside of nerve cells. And that is what makes action potentials possible. The proton pump is the active pumping of hydrogens against their concentration gradient across a membrane. That will become important when we talk about cellular respiration. And then endo, endocytosis and exocytosis. There you go. That's active transport, but it's using the cell membrane because the substances are way too large to have a protein to help them. So vesicles form. So you see all these little thingies coming into the membrane. Ooh, a little vesicle form. Sorry if you can hear my kids screaming. They're crazy. Okay, um, that's endocytosis. She's just playing, I promise. She's not in distress. Um, exocytosis is the opposite where there's a vesicle fusing with the membrane and something's being released. It should this 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 stuff is too big for it to go through a protein, so it just needs to use the vesicles and the membrane, and it requires energy. The things listed in number 11 use ATP, why? Um, well, because things are being pumped against their concentra concentration gradient for the electrogenic pumps, and then for this one, it's having to form an actual vesicle, and that requires energy. Okay, what is the goal of an electrogenic pump? The goal of an electrogenic pump is to what am I looking for? Oh, it's to generate voltage across the membrane. So the goal of an electrogenic pump is to pump enough positives out to where it's all positive on the outside and negative on the inside. And that's going to set the cell up to be able to do some kind of work. So we already saw the sodium potassium pump allows a neuron. It sets it up to do an action potential. Uh, when we get to cellular respiration, you're going to see what the proton pump sets the cell up to do to make ATP. So... It's really cool. I find electrogenic pumps to be so interesting. <laughs> like maybe too interesting. Maybe that's weird, but I think they're so cool. Like it's just so smart. It's like who came up with that? All right. Well, I don't have number 14 on here. Dang it. Uh, what happened? Sorry guys, 14's cut off for me. You're gonna have to just figure that one out. I was wanting to know what happened to the dialysis tubing experiment. So remember I put the dialysis tubing and I put the starch solution on the inside, it was white. Then I put it into a beaker with water and iodine. Um, and then we hypothesized what would happen. 
starch was too big to leave the membrane, like to leave across the dialysis tubing membrane. But iodine and water were not too big. So iodine and water went into the bag in order to try to achieve some kind of equilibrium. And we knew that because it turned a dark blue. Iodine and starch together will turn a dark blue. And the other reason why we knew water came in is because the bag ended up weighing more at the end. Got into any of that. All right. Um, what happened with your potatoes and why? Well, the really high concentrated sugar solution made the potato lose weight and it made it like flaccid and flimsy because it was hypertonic. That was a hypertonic solution. Um, when you put the potato in just pure water, it gained a lot of weight. That's a hypotonic solution. It's just because water moves from a high to a low water potential and it moves from a low to a high solute concentration. Number 17 says something about what happened with your eggs and why. This was from last year. You guys did not do the eggs. So skip that question. Um, part four lab. How can you determine the exact... Girls, I'm like trying to make a video. How do you, can you determine the exact solute concentration of a potato using different sugar solutions? Okay, you do basically what we did, and then you do the graph. So you see the graph on... I am going to have to move to another room. Oh, my God. So I'm looking at this graph that's on this next page. Hold on, I'm walking. I know y'all can't, like, see anything, but I don't know what to show you. Here, I'll show you this slide. There you go. <laughs> Um, you didn't design your own investigation. Um, so we're looking at the graph. Percent change in mass of potato cores at different molarities of sucrose. Uh, wherever the line crosses the x-axis, that means that the that's the concentration where the potato core would have been isotonic. So that's how you get the um, that's how you get the whatever the molarity of sugar of the potato itself. What else is it asking this? Yep. So that's basically the lab that it's going over. All right, let me put this down, and I'm going to put cell communication up, because cell communication is, is on this test. It is, all right, just all of these things. All right, it, I'm just going to kind of skip through those. All right, the three stages of cell communication are reception, transduction, and response. Reception is the binding of a signaling molecule to the receptor, and it's highly specific. It has to fit. That's really important. So reception, transduction, response has to fit. Highly specific. You have two types of receptors, plasma membrane receptors that are embedded in the membrane, and you have intracellular receptors that are inside the cell. Please, please be able to tell me that if you have a hydrophobic hormone, like a steroid hormone, like testosterone or estrogen. It does not need a plasma membrane receptor. It doesn't need that. It just goes right in. It's like it has VIP access to the cell or something. It just goes right in. So its receptor would be inside the cell. But you have some water-soluble ligands, some hydrophilic ligands, like insulin is an example of a hydrophilic ligand. It needs a membrane receptor, a receptor that's on the membrane. And so that's where we got to the three types. So the ligand is gonna to bind to the receptor protein. The protein changes shape, it has a conformational change. And that's really what a lot of this is about, is just proteins changing shape, making something else happen, kind of like, a, like dominoes, like a domino effect. And so that's gonna initiate a transduction signal. All right, so we have three types of membrane receptors. First one is G protein. So I, I don't need to really talk through what's happening in this picture because you wrote it down in your notes. I mean, I guess I will because I'm doing the video, but I mean, you don't have to watch this video. You can fast forward or do whatever. I'm just going to, I'm just going to make it thorough. All right. Step one, nothing's happening, but notice you have a, you have a receptor embedded in the membrane. You have a G protein that's on the inside of the cell. Then you have this enzyme. All right. A signaling molecule binds. Just follow my cursor. A signaling molecule binds. GTP activates the G protein. Then step three, 
the G protein activates an enzyme and causes a cellular response. The ligand leaves, everything is inactive again. That's it. That's all that's happening. All right, next picture. Receptor tyrosine kinase, there's two parts. It requires two signaling molecules. The two signaling molecules bind. The two tyrosine kinase receptors come together to form what's called a dimer. Then ATP comes in, adds six phosphates, really activating the receptor. Then you have these relay proteins that come in, and then you have multiple cellular responses that result. Remember, receptor tyrosine kinase is really devoted to um, cell growth and division. And so its disease was, was cancer, the disease associated with it, All right? That, I mean, that's it. It's just on your notes. Just go to your notes if you didn't hear me. All right, the third one is ligand-gated ion channels. A signaling molecule binds. So this is just a, it's a protein embedded in a membrane. That's what all three of these are, just proteins embedded in a membrane. They're all just shaped a little different and do something a little different. So signaling, so, so in step one, the gate's closed. Step two, the signaling molecule binds, the gate opens, ions flow through, a cellular response results. Step three, the ligand leaves, the gate closes. Signaling is done. All right. Sorry, my girls are fighting. Oh, this is so embarrassing. Okay, the phosphorylation cascade transduction. So transduction is going to involve um, the amplification of the signal through the cell. So what it's basically doing, I had to move again. Basically what it's doing is it's taking a signal from the outside of the cell that is fit into a receptor and it's amplifying it, making sure the signal gets all the way through the cell to the target molecule. And you're like, well, what's the target molecule? Um, it's either the nucleus or it's an enzyme that's inside the cell that needs to do something. All right, and um, it's the phosphorylation cascade. What are the main players of the phosphorylation cascade? Protein kinases. And what's the purpose to enhance and amplify the signal? All right. So if you had to draw an arrow of the sequence of events, you see my cursor here? You draw it down this way. All right. I'm going to do it again. Start with the signaling molecule and the activity, the sequence of activities move down. It's a sequence of activities. Signaling molecule binds to a receptor. The relay molecule is activated. Activate protein kinase 1. Then activate protein kinase, kinase 2. Then activate protein kinase 3. Then activate some kind of other protein. Then a cellular response. So if anything messes up up here, if the signaling molecule can't bind, none of these other things are going to happen. Ooh, I hope someone's watching this video because that is a question. It's going to say something like, what happens if the receptor's messed up? Well, the answer is then nothing that occurs after that receptor is going to happen. None of it. If the receptor's messed up. All right. I hope that helps somebody. Let me know if it was you. Let me know. You're like, yeah, I watched your video. I got that question right. You should come up to me and say that. I'd like to know who actually watches these. Um, all right, the last thing is the response. Second messengers, uh, just sickly. Okay. This relay molecule right here, that's like the second messenger. It just kicks off the phosphorylation cascade. Cyclic AMP is our example. Um, and then response, we already wrote that down. It's either going to uh, activate the nucleus to transcribe and translate something, turn some genes on and off, or it's going to activate an enzyme. And speaking of enzymes, that's next. Oh, well, okay. Enzymes is next. What did I do with it? What did I do? Enzyme lecture. Boom. Here we go. All right. Play from current slide. What is the purpose of an enzyme? All right. So you're on, uh, on your notes, pages 77 to 81. I'm on number one, enzyme review. The purpose of an enzyme. What am I doing? The purpose of an enzyme is to, um, yeah, speed up the rate of a reaction without alt being altered in the process. Its purpose is to lower the activation energy required for a reaction to occur. Parts of the enzyme substrate, yeah, speeds up metabolic reaction by lowering the activation energy. And this graph right here is so important because the black hump shows you without an enzyme, the red hump shows you with an enzyme, the energy required to start that reaction is lowered, therefore the reaction occurs more easily. An enzyme helps that. 
the parts of an enzyme substrate complex. Oh, look, it works. Look at that. Look at that. Oh my God, that's so beautiful. There it is. I wonder if it'll play again. All right, so there's your substrate, your active site. The yellow thing is your enzyme. And then there's your products. Those are the parts. What are the steps for enzymatic activity? Substrate enters the active site. Hold on. I have twins, y'all, and they, they fight sometimes. My husband's watching them, though. I'm just going to let them duke it out. All right, so substrates enter the active site. They're held in the active site by weak interactions. I promise I'm not a bad parent. My husband is watching them. So I can do this. Um, the, act, uh, the activation energy is lowered. The reaction is speeded up. Substrates are converted into product. Y'all write this down on your notes. I mean, just look at the notes. And now it's available. What's most important here, what's most important about this picture, is that the substrates fit into the active site. And then after the reaction occurs, the enzyme is left unchanged. That's what's also really important. All right, what can alter the functioning of an enzyme? Ooh, here we go. Temperature, pH, or chemicals. Why do these things alter the enzyme activity? Because it, they change the protein folding. We've gone over and over that. I just don't know how many more times I can do that. <laughs> it just changes the protein folding because amino acids are interacting with each other. Ah. All right, what are cofactors and coenzymes? Get an example of each. A cofactor is a non-protein helper. An example would be zinc. It just like stabilizes the active site. It's like a little helper. It's like, here, let me hold your hair back. It's kind of like that. That sounded horrible, but it, it's just there to help. And zinc would be an example. Coenzymes are cofactors. They still are cofactors. They're non-proteins and they help, but they're organic, like vitamins. So coenzymes are organic cofactors, like vitamins, like vitamin A, vitamin C, all those vitamins. Cool. Oh, there's some strat. Oh, come to office hours. Most likely the people that are watching this aren't the ones that need to come to office hours. All right, uh, next. What are what are enzyme activators and inhibitors? What are non-competitive inhibition? What's competitive inhibition? Um, and a competitive inhibitor, I'm just gonna go to the picture. Competitive inhibitor is going to bind to the active site so the substrate can't bind. So it'd be like a drug or a poison. A non-competitive inhibitor is going to bind somewhere other than the active site, allosterically, changing the shape of the active site so that the substrate can't bind. And I gave examples. Oh, uh, which one's concentration dependent? Ooh, you got to know this. You got to know this. You got to know this. Competitive inhibition is concentration dependent. That means if you put more substrate in, it could overcome the competitive inhibitor. It could beat it out, basically. With non-competitive inhibition, because the shape of the active site has been changed, it doesn't matter how much more substrate you put, it's not going to work. All right, and I went through some examples. Cyanide is an example of a non-competitive inhibitor. Um, cholesterol drugs are, are competitive inhibitors. So it's like a pharmaceutical thing, poison thing. All right, let's see. What's the next question? Um, what are... Enzyme activators and inhibitors, well, they're just things that activate or inhibit the enzyme. <laughs> kind of like, oh, I used um, blood clotting as an example. So there are blood clotting activators and blood clotting inhibitors that kind of oscillate back and forth just to make sure that there's a balance and you're not clotting too much or that you're not bleeding too much. Mm -mm -mm. What is cooperativity? Okay, cooperativity is okay just kidding dude where did cooperativity go oh my god i don't know where it went what is going on here sorry these are slides from like a couple years ago i think um okay well you know cooperativity is just there it is god i was already on it um, one substrate triggers a shape change in the other active site. So this is if an enzyme has multiple active sites. One of the active sites is occupied by the substrate. So what it does when it binds is it makes the other active sites even more, I guess the word, attracted to substrate. So sub substrate will actually bind faster and things will start happening faster. 
Um, hemoglobin is an example of that when it binds oxygen. I'm not going to ask you about cooperativity, so just never mind. <laughs> just cross that question out. Feedback inhibition is really important. Feedback inhibition is where the product of a pathway loops back around and inhibits the original enzyme that started the pathway. So you have your initial substrate, it binds to an enzyme, it undergoes a series of reactions and it becomes isoleucine, yay, because we needed isoleucine. And it's gonna do that several times. It's gonna have several uh, three anines being converted into isoleucines, but at some point enough isoleucine is gonna build up to where it will loop around and it will bind to enzyme one changing the shape of the active site, stopping the production of more of it. That's called feedback inhibition, negative feedback. More gets you less, basically. So this is interesting because it's allosterically binding to the enzyme, changing the active site so that threonine can't bind anymore. All right, and I think, and what a perfect example with the noise that we've had today, um, I think such a good like a, like analogy, I guess, is that like when you have kids, you reach this certain point, this threshold where your kids will just act so awful that it will like make you not want to have more kids. <laughs> so it's kind of what's happening. Like you make the child, but then the child acts so awful that they are like, uh, uh, I'm having no more. All right. Um, action potential is next. I don't think I have a slide for action potential actually, but let me, no, let me just bring up a neuron action potential picture. Pick. Okay. Neuron action pick. Hey, that's good enough. There we go. Let's see. Yeah, you're just seeing, um, please just show me the picture. Oh my God. I wish I could zoom in on this, this, this laptop sucks. So just look at your notes. Just look at the parts. So if you can kind of see my, um, Cursor here, need know where the dendrites are. Where's the axon? Where's the axon terminals? What direction does information flow? It flows from the dendrites to the axon terminals. Uh, what is the chemical messenger involved in action potential? It would be your neurotransmitters, right? So just know the parts of the neuron, which direction it flows. What are some common neurotransmitters? So serotonin, dopamine, I'm not going to ask you about any of those, but I think it's important just to know them, especially if you're interested in neurology at all. How does the sodium potassium pump set up membrane potential? I mean, we've already talked about that. Like go back to chapter five, three sodiums out for every two potassiums in makes it positive on the outside, negative on the inside, because there's an imbalance of positive charges. Uh, what does every step on the graph on page 71 mean? Look in the textbook on set page 780 for help. So the graph should be something like this one. There you go. Ooh. Okay, so it's kind of showing it on this right side here. Like, what does each one mean? Well, at resting, resting membrane potential, the sodium potassium pump has created the inside of the cell to be negative 70 millivolts. Then when a, something happens and a neuron is triggered, depolarization, sodium flows in and it becomes more positive on the outside, on the inside, it becomes more positive on the inside. Then sodium channels close, potassium channels open, and potassium leaves the neuron. And it starts to become more negative. That's called repolarization. Hyperpolarization is where the charge becomes less than negative 70 because the potassium channels are still closing. And then the sodium potassium pump restores everything back to regular um, resting potential, negative 70. Define the following words, resting potential, repolarization, depolarization. That's on your paper. And then that's, that's all I can see for the review. Ooh, 45 minutes. All right. Um, yeah, come to office hours. Let me know if you have any questions. Other than that, like I feel like I went through everything. All right, thanks, bye.